Hi, everybody. Uh, it's Craig Campbell from Nerdburger Games, and uh, I do this thing on my Discord where I let people ask questions, and sometimes I talk about those and answer those questions in the Discord, and sometimes they require a little more work and a little more thought. So here we are, and I'm going to go through some of those questions, a um, little bit about kind of GMing, a little bit about game design stuff, and uh, maybe you'll find this interesting, maybe you'll find this useful. Um, if you asked questions uh, over the last couple months, it's taken me a while to get to this. Sorry, everybody. Um, give it a listen. Um, way back at the beginning of it, Ardent Idler asked, uh, let's say I finish a draft of my universal RPG that I am happy with. The game is solid and works. It has been thoroughly playtested and is unanimously loved. But I have tapped out the people I know. How do I go about marketing it uh, without spending a lot of money? Am I, uh, I am trying to get involved with social, uh, I assume you mean social media, but I feel like I am missing a step between where I am now and being ready to launch a successful Kickstarter. Um, there's a bunch of questions in there, and there's some kind of loaded stuff that's in there, and I'm going to address all of it, but first things first, um, this is based on my personal experience. This, uh, you, I could be completely wrong, you could, with all of this stuff. Um, I think it's probably pretty spot on. Um, advice and pretty useful hopefully but you might find uh, that there's another way for you and you might find advice from other people that uh, say do something different or, or approach it a, a little differently um, who knows it, a lot of this is just kind of trying to see what you can do see what you can make happen um, universal RPG first of all that is a hard sell uh, there are universal RPGs out there there's actually quite a lot of them but when you really think about it there's only a handful that are, are seriously um, successful in terms of their, uh, you know, getting a lot of players and their being applicable and having a lot of settings kind of published along with them um, and supplements that go with them. There's really only maybe a half dozen that are big. Um, if your definition of success is, I want to make a game and put it out there and have some people play it and like it, then go nuts. If your definition of success is, I want to make a universal RPG that is broadly success successful and um, gets a lot of people playing it and is the next big thing, then um, that's a little tough to do just as a straight universal RPG because that's not really a selling point to a lot of gamers. A lot of gamers are going to say, well, what's the game about? Well, it's, you know, you tell them, well, it's a universal RPG. You can do anything. And then they're like, well, I, I've got a lot of things I'd like to do. Can I do this thing? Because they're going to say, you know, well, well what, you know, I, I, I like a fantasy game. I like a sci-fi game. I like a supers game. I like a dark game. Um, I like a horror game. My suggestion to perhaps help you with um, getting the system out there is to create um, a setting or supplement or thing that kind of goes along with it that um, gives it uh, a, a little more of an appeal. Um, you know, it, I'm not sure what that might be. What interests you is really what it comes down to. What's the thing you want to do with that universal RPG? Um, but create like, you know, a game with it might be fantasy, it might be sci-fi, whatever it is you find. Um, you want to pursue and try to get people to play that and then say, oh, and by the way, in addition to this really cool sci-fi game, the system is very malleable and it can be worked to do all sorts of other things and here's how you can do that and then you can kind of build that. Um, you m remark that it's uh, been play tested and, and people love it but that it's only that you've tapped out the people you know. So here's the, uh, here's the upside and the downside to having things, play testing things with your friends. Number one is you've got a group. They're right there. They're ready to try it out. So you have no excuse. You have an easy way to get out, to get it at the table and to make it all happen and, and get to see the game in play. That's the great side. It's like you've got this built-in thing. The downside is they're your friends. And that's a good thing, too, because they're going to be supportive and that having that cheering section is useful. And I like to keep, like, I've got friends who play some of my games and stuff, and when I talk to them about it, I just kind of, I ask them for the nice things. Like, they, they're, they're supportive and they're and they're cool, um, and they help to keep me focused and happy and, and feeling like I'm moving things forward and things are going well. Um, but they might, you know, your friends might not tell you what's wrong with the game. They might, or if they do tell you where there's problems, they might be a little too nice about it um, and kind of cushion the blow, and maybe you think, well, maybe, okay, that's not that big of a problem because they were only kind of saying it was, oh, it's a little weird when really what they mean is there's a problem. So getting people outside of your friend group to play test is very, very useful. How can you do that? Um, 
it's really a question of just reaching out into every realm you can think of. Um, you can reach out on social media through your own social media um, and try to get kind of friends and friends of friends. Basically, that's the best part about social media is that it's a whole network. So you can go friends of friends. Um, so that's people that you don't know. Um, take a look at uh, posting to boards where they uh, uh, promote um, people looking for play testers and, and new systems. Um, go to the gauntlet. Um, they have a very robust uh, series of online games that they run. Um, lots of different GMs. There's a lot of playtesting that goes on there. They have a community that is very much into playing indie games um, and in particular playtesting things. So take a look for the gauntlet. If you want to promote on my um, Discord channel, throw a, throw a note up there saying, hey, I'm looking for playtesters for this. I, look, I need some strangers to try this game out. Um, do that by all means. Um, I'll help pimp it. Um, go to forums and so forth and just and reach out. Also, go to local conventions and game days and to game stores on Saturday afternoon or whatever when people are just perusing and have a little sign and just have people sit down and you know walk them through the system for half an hour and get their, get their thoughts. Um, that does twofold. That gets you marketing so people start to become aware of your game. Um, and also maybe somebody points something out that could be, uh, you know, help to make the game better. So, um, and, you know, how long do you need to do that before you run a Kickstarter? You know, that's kind of a question of how much do you want to struggle with the Kickstarter? Um, the more you have, the more people you have in place who are ready to back on day one, the easier the whole process is going to be. So, like with mergers and acquisitions, I was actively going to local conventions and occasional further away conventions and, um, and reaching out to pl find play testers for probably a year and a half before I went to Kickstarter. Now that was maybe longer than I needed to, and there are certainly people out there that have done it for shorter periods of time. Um, but uh, you know, six months at least of building awareness. Um, if you're looking to play test as well, probably longer than that. So um, you know, it's it's a process. It takes a great deal of time. If you can, if you've got the free time to make things happen faster then by all means do. But, uh, you know, like my, my, my year, year and a half kind of thing, that was because I work a 50 hour a week day job and I was just kind of working on this part time in my, in my spare time. So, you know, it's a question of how much time can you put toward it? If you can put a lot of time toward it, you can punch through a lot of stuff faster. You can reach a lot more people faster. Um, so yeah, it's kind of what, sorry <laughs> kind of what do you want to you know how do you want to approach it how much time do you want to put into it um and then uh you know start to reach out when you get closer to kickstarter then you start thinking about kickstarter specific things like reaching out to being on podcasts um and doing interviews and getting uh, people who do who write blogs and things like that and you can start to reach out that way but uh you know just general awareness and building a mailing list if you've got like a mailchimp account or some similar system um you know, get, get people to, to demo your game for an hour and then ask if you can put them on a mailing list um, and say, hey, I'll only, I'm will i not going to throw a whole bunch of emails at you. I'm just going to let you know when the Kickstarter goes. That's what I did with Murders and Acquisitions was I, I gave them a promise. I will send you one email and one email only, and that's when the Kickstarter goes. Um, so that helps uh, people agree to, uh, that eases their, their fears that you're going to start spamming their inbox. So there you go. Ardent Idler. Good luck. Um, Whipstash asks, what are some important things to do when GMing a system for the first time? Um, well, I would say that uh, there's the biggest thing with GMing a system for the first time is knowledge, right? Um, because it's because it's new to you, you don't know um, enough. Like, you know, like if I design the game or if I've been playing D&D forever, I can run that without even thinking hard. Um, you give me dice and a pen and paper and I can run those games and you know with along with the book. Um, so with with something that's very new to you, I'd say like know the core of the game system. That doesn't mean you need to know every rule. Um, there, you know, there, there will be times when you'll need to look things up, but know the core stuff so that you can do most things without having to flip through pages of the book. Um, and then you can build out into learning and, and finding those other things later. And occasionally you might have to, um, you know, look something up during the game. Um, maybe make the players aware, like say, if we're in the middle of, uh, of a combat or some other kind of time pressure 
uh, sensitive um, scene, I may just make a ruling on something rather than take the time to crack the book because I don't want to kill the, the pacing um, and the urgency of the scene. But then we'll look it up later and we'll find out what the real rule is and we'll go from there. Um, so make sure the players are aware that you might do that. Um, but know, know, you know, know, know the basics. Ba make sure you're conversant with it. Um, and you know, know that the players are going to be new to it too and they're going to be very forgiving, hopefully. Um, most players are pretty forgiving when it comes to GMs who, um, who are who are doing something for the first time, and they know and they know that the GM is is new to the system. And then when like the setting and the tone and what the game's about, you know, know the basics of that too, and be prepared to feature that. Like if you're running Shadow of the Demon Lord for the first time, make sure that you're hitting on that dark horror fantasy element. Don't make it. Let, don't let it feel like a D and D game. It 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 is kind of a D and D game. It has D and D vibes to it, but it's dark and it's there's there's some there's some real kind of heaviness to some of what's in the game, um, and that's that's the thematic thing that needs to show through to set it apart from D and D. So um, you know, just make sure you kind of have a, a, a three, four, five watchwords in mind. Keep those in mind all the time, and make sure you're kind of hitting that setting and tone kind of information. Um, and don't be afraid to screw up, um, if, especially if the players know that you're new to it. They're going to know you're going to screw up. They're going to screw up. Just, you know, screw up, fix it, be consistent, um, and I think you'll probably be fine. People will be pretty forgiving, um, uh, especially, you know, in those very early games. And, and that will get you the confidence to, to deal with, uh, you know, get better at it. And, you know, by the time you get your get to your 10th game session, you'll be rocking and rolling and you'll, you know, it'll feel like you've never not known the game. Oh, so let's see what else. Um, Whipstash also asks, uh, how does one decide which creative idea to pursue? How do you avoid the trap of wanting to do all the things which results in doing none of them? Um, it's a it's a great problem to have having too many good ideas because there are going to be times when you're going to have no good ideas. So um, I would say, you know, what works for me personally, just going for what works for me, is to go ahead and pursue each of them. You know, spend a little bit of time, not a lot, but a little, you know, outline three ideas that you have. And at some point, for me, what happens is one of them starts to sing more to me and starts to feel like, oh, this is a thing that is more real or could become uh, more complete faster that I feel that, you know, that I feel I could pursue, that I'm getting more excited about. Um, and then, you know, the, the cream rises and the things that you want to pursue rise. And the other things kind of drift into the background and you might return to them or you might decide, well, that really wasn't that great of an idea. Maybe I've got this other better idea. So I, I go ahead and let, you know, pursue each one of them a little bit. In time, something will jump out at you as being the thing to, uh, to really go after. Um, that's just, uh, that's what works for me. Um... James Eck asks, how many mechanics are too many? <laughs> um, and, and how important is it for mechanics to follow a similar format or pattern? Um, how many mechanics are too many? I don't think there's such a thing as too many mechanics, except on the, you know, like, be reasonable side. Um, but, you know, like that is to say, having a lot of mechanics isn't necessarily bad. There are players who love having a lot of mechanics. They like really crunchy systems. Um, they love looking up rules, and they love uh, of gaming the system and trying to build a, a character that uh, uses all these little fiddly bits and becomes really cool. Um, it becomes kind of a question of, like, how many mechanics are, for you, are too many if you're designing something. You know, that's that's an upper limit of, well, it becomes a question again of what's successful to you. Do you want a game that, you know, that, that is the game you want it to be and it's going to find a home and, and, and be liked and played by some people? Um, then don't get too worried about too many mechanics, although, you know, when there's really too many, you'll know, um, and your players will tell you. Um, but there will be players that'll be that'll like that. Now, if you're looking at, you know, if your definition of success is um, 
to find uh, more people to play your game, then you have to be careful about getting too robust. The same way you have to be careful about being too light. Um, there are certainly people out there who like horror games who would look at Die Laughing, my game, which has you know one mechanic in it that does two things, and they would say, this, this, just, this is not for me. This is, there's not enough here. Um, so you know, it's a question of finding that middle ground. Um, and that comes a lot, I think, a lot out of playtesting. You'll talk, you'll, you'll have people play and people will tell you like, this is too complex. There's way too much going on here or there's, or there's not enough or whatever. Um, I think when it comes to uh, mechanics that follow a similar format or pattern, that tends to be something that people want to see in more uh, contemporary games. Uh, gone are the days of, uh, you know, second edition D&D and before where, you were rolling a d20 and you want high, or you were rolling a d20 and you want low, or you were rolling this many dice or that many dice, or you were rolling percentiles, or, you know, there was so many different mechanics because they, those games were built out of war games and the war games kind of did what they needed to do. Whereas now, ga nowadays games um, systems tend to be more tightly codified and um, use thing, you know, like if you're rolling high in one mechanic, you probably need to roll high in other mechanics. Um, within the system so i think um you know to appeal to the modern audience um it's important that there are um, a similar f similar formats and patterns um that if it's a dice pool system that you don't suddenly break out of the pool idea too often like you can you can have a few things where it's like well rather than rolling d6s all the time for this dice pool occasionally you'll roll a single d6 and determine this thing and you can do that for a few things but don't do it for too many if the game is supposed to be a dice a d6 dice pool system because that's what people want they're coming to your game because it allows them to run roll a whole bunch of d6s and people love rolling dice um and and seeing how many sixes you get or adding them all up or whatever it is the mechanic does so um, you know, the same way your setting um, and your tone and the themes of your game and the genre of your game are appealing to certain people, and that's what they come to the game for, the mechanics themselves can also do that. The mechanics can be, oh, I, I really like this game because it allows me to roll a whole bunch of D6s, or I really like this game because all I have to do is roll 1D12 every now and then. Um, because they like how, how the system works. So if the system is too all over the place, um, there are certainly players that are fine with that, but there will be players that are kind of like, eh, it's not my cup of tea. I want, uh, I want something a little more uh, pointed and, uh, and cogent. Um, so there you go. I think uh, that covers the questions I'm going to go through here for today. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, that's it for now. Bye-bye.